Good morning everyone. Welcome to my Mechanics One live stream workout. Well, strictly speaking, it's not a live stream. Uh, if I come clean, what happened was when the live stream was loaded up, a lot of you then started reporting an error that uh, you weren't able to uh, see the uh, live stream. So what I've done for you today is just re-record it, okay, without the live interaction that we've had in the past. So uh, when it comes to uh, the end of the question, I've set up a timer, 15 second timer, give you time to uh, just pause the video and then uh, come back when you are try the question and I run through the uh, work solution for you. So I hope you'll still get the same benefit from it. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, for watching and we'll get started with the questions. Okay, so for question number one, we've got a small stone here is projected upwards with a speed of three meters per second from a height of two meters above the ground and taking the acceleration of gravity to be approximately 10 meters per second per second, find the time taken for the stone to hit the ground. And as you can see, I've just sketched this out, okay? There's our stone projected upwards three meters per second from a height of two meters above the ground. Take the acceleration due to gravity to be approximately 10 meters per second per second and that acts downwards, okay? So just leave you with this one for a few moments. Just uh, pause the video. When you come back, you can view the work solution. Okay, welcome back then if you had a go. So let's just see how we do this kind of problem. Well, it's a typical, what I would call SUVAT type equation where you've got to list your variables, S, U, V, A, and T. What I've done here is I've taken um, upwards, as you can see, as positive, which is always a good idea in the direction of motion. And we're starting from the point of projection. So when we're trying to find the time taken to hit the ground, okay, the particle, the stone in this case, is going to go up, come back down, hit the ground. So S, the displacement, well, that's going to be negative 2 if we start from up here. Okay, so we'll put that one in, that S is negative 2. U is the initial velocity. We know what that is. It's 3 meters per second upwards in the positive sense. So therefore, U equals 3. V the final velocity when the stone hits the ground, well, we don't know that. It's a common misconception that it's going to be zero, that it comes to rest immediately, it hits the ground. Okay, so we don't know about that final velocity. So just put a question mark there, say. As for the acceleration, that throughout the motion is downwards, okay, in the opposite sense to what we've got here. So that is going to be minus 10. So we've got the acceleration is minus 10 and the time it takes, well, that's what we're trying to find. So I'm just going to call that, say, big T, big T seconds, okay? Now, when you've put down your variables, you should be aware of your equations for constant motion, constant acceleration in a straight line, okay? I've listed them out here, okay? Now, the one that we want would be an equation that doesn't involve V, but has the T in it. And that equation is going to be the one at the bottom here. S equals UT plus a half AT squared. So put a note to that effect using S equals UT plus a half AT squared. Substitute our values in. If you substitute your values in, this is the equation you're going to get. And I can see that the half of minus 10, that's going to be negative 5. So I could simplify this equation, giving me this. What we've got is a quadratic in t, so we'd need to rearrange this, make it equal to 0. 
Sometimes, especially if you're using g to be 9.8, this won't factorize and you'll have to use the quadratic formula. But I've picked this so that it does factorize very easily and you'll find it factorizes to that. Put each of the factors equal to zero and solve. And you'll get two values for the time t. Which one is it? Well, it's got to be the positive one. It takes one second for this stone to go up, come back down and hit the ground, okay? So the answer is basically that the time to hit the ground is one second. You can't have negative time. However, there is a reason for this answer, okay? We can give a reason for it. Minus two fifths is basically the time it would have taken if the particle had traveled up here at three meters per second, okay, had been given some velocity. We don't know what that velocity would have been, but nonetheless, if it had gone up here two meters at this point, traveled three meters per second under this acceleration due to gravity, the time it would have taken would have been two fifths of a second, okay? So it's like going back in time. So hope you were able to get that one, all right? Now, with this workout, there are five questions, so we're just gonna move on to the second one. And moving on to the second one, we've got a problem here on moments. So we've got a uniform beam, AC, which I've drawn here, of mass 16 kilograms and length six meters, rests in a horizontal position in equilibrium on a support at B. One meter from the end A. And there's a mass of m kilograms. This mass of m kilograms is placed at A. And we, you've got to find what that mass m would be. Okay, so again, leave you just for a short while to try that. Okay, so uh, just give you a moment to pause the video. Okay, welcome back then if you had a go at that one. So let's see how you got on. Well, it's a typical moments question. If you're unfamiliar with moments, just a note here that if you have a force, F Newton say, acting perpendicularly at a distance of D meters from a point O, then this force is going to want to turn about O. And that moment about O is given by the force F times that perpendicular distance D back to the point O that you're turning about, okay? So the way that I've approached this then is, first of all, we need to put on our forces. It's a uniform beam of mass 16 kilograms, so therefore the weight will act in the middle, okay? That weight will be mg, 16g newtons, okay? So the, the being a uniform rod or beam in this case, six meters, then this is gonna be three meters from A and obviously three meters from C. So we've got that extra two meters put in there. We need to put on the weight of the particle at A, that's going to be mg newtons acting downwards. There'll also be a force upwards to keep this in equilibrium, and that's going to be the reaction at B. So I've called that RB Newtons. Now, if we're to find out what this force is, uh, what the mass is, okay, M, then what I'm going to need to do is apply moments. Moments about B. The reason we take B is because this reaction force here passes through the point we're taking moments about, like O, for instance. And if you've got a force passing through O, then if we use this equation, D would be zero. And so your moment would be zero. So there'll be no turning effect about B, and that means it, RB would not enter our equation. So that's the reason for doing that. We can take moments in 
the clockwise sense or the anti-clockwise sense as being uh, a positive direction. That doesn't matter. I'm going to take in the anti-clockwise sense purely because it will make this term positive, but that's up to you as you'll see. If I take moments about B as being the anti-clockwise direction is positive, then my equation will be this. I will get mg times one, okay, mg times one. I've put minus because this weight of the beam is going to want to turn in a clockwise sense about B, okay? So it's gonna be minus, because it's in the opposite sense to this, the force, which is the weight here, 16G, times the distance back to B, which is gonna be the two. And this is my overall moment. And because it's in equilibrium, there's no turning effect. So the resultant moment is zero. I prefer this way rather than saying, anti-clockwise moments equals clockwise moments, okay? As uh, that can lead to problems I've found in later uh, questions where it's not in equilibrium. You're just looking for a resultant moment. There's my resultant moment and that equals zero because it's in equilibrium, okay? So we move on. If you rearrange this now, very easy for M, you can see you get 32g over g, the g's cancel, so it's independent of the acceleration due to gravity, and so m turns out to be 32. Notice it's 32, not 32 kilograms, because we did say that it was a mass of m kilograms, so the value of m is just going to be 32. Okay, um, just out of interest, as an extra bit, if you were asked to work out that reaction at b, then we do it by resolving all the forces upwards minus all the forces downwards would equal zero, okay? That's what we're doing here. If I resolve upwards, that resultant force RB minus 32G minus 16G would equal zero. So RB would equal 48G, okay? So you could substitute your value for G in there. If G was taken to be 10, meters per second per second uh, approximately, then that will clearly be 480 newtons. Then that would be clearly 480 newtons. All right, so uh, hope you're able to get that one. Let's move on, question three now. Okay, so uh, moving on to question three. Here it is here. I've sketched a diagram just to save time. This is a typical kind of diagram that you will see on an exam paper or in a textbook where we've got a light inextensible string, okay, passing over a smooth pulley. And what the question is, is to find the acceleration of the three kilogram particle in terms of G, the acceleration due to gravity, okay? So again, just leave you with that one for a few moments. And when you come back, we'll run through the solution. Okay, let's see how you got on. So the first thing you need to do is mark in the weights, okay, of our two particles here, the three kilogram, the eight kilogram. Those weights, remember, is gonna be mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So it's three G downwards here, and eight G downwards on the eight kilogram particle. Units are Newtons. Then we need to mark in the tensions, okay? And I'm gonna mark in those tensions here as T Newtons upwards here, and T Newtons up here. These tensions are the same. And quite often you're asked why they are the same or how have you used some of these facts up here in your question? Well, thing is it passes over a smooth pulley. And because the string passes over a smooth pulley, these tensions are exactly the same. Okay, now need to mark in the accelerations. This is 
ha uh, heavier particle than the three kilogram one, it's going to go downwards. This one is going to move upwards. So I'm marking the accelerations. And there they are. I've called them A, okay? This one's accelerating upwards with acceleration A. This one's accelerating downwards with an acceleration A. Why are they the same? Okay, they're the same because we are using an inextensible string. Okay, it doesn't stretch. So as soon as this particle moves downwards, this one will immediately move upwards with the same acceleration. So that's how I've used the fact that the accelerations are exactly the same. Okay, the other thing, might as well mention it here, a light inextensible string. Imagine if this was a heavy chain, for instance. As this came over the pulley here, and this side of the chain gets longer, there's going to be more weight on this side, more force acting downwards, okay? So the force acting downwards is going to change. It's never going to remain exactly constant at 8G newtons, okay? This one would get shorter, so the force acting downwards is going to change. So that's one of the reasons why we use a light string, okay? Inextensible makes the accelerations the same. Smooth pulley means the tensions are the same. Okay, so uh, just uh, giving you a little bit of background there, okay? Now, what we need to do is take each particle in turn and we resolve. Take the three kilogram one, we resolve in the direction of acceleration. So we're going to have T minus 3G equals the mass 3 times the acceleration. That's what we are doing when we're resolving. We're using Newton's law of motion. Force equals mass times acceleration. This is our resultant force on the 3 kilogram particle equals the mass times acceleration. We're taking upwards as positive. Now, when we come down to this particle, the 8 kilogram mass, there's the acceleration acting downwards. It's best to resolve downwards in the direction of acceleration, taking that as positive. And if you do that, our resultant force is going to be 8G minus the tension T. And that's going to equal the mass, 8 times the acceleration. If you did decide to resolve upwards, there's nothing to stop you, but you've got to be careful. If upwards is taken as the positive sense, this becomes minus 8g, this becomes plus t, this becomes 8 times negative a, ending up at minus 8a. It will still work out, but it's much better to resolve in the direction of the acceleration. Okay? Right. We've got two equations. We need to solve for... Um, we, we need to get the acceleration. So what we need to do is eliminate the t's between these two equations. So if I number them, 1 and 2, I can easily eliminate t just by adding the two equations. So if you do that, 1 add 2 gives 5g, okay, 8g added to minus 3g is 5g, and you're going to get 11a there. So just rearrange it for a in terms of g and the acceleration is 5g over 11. I didn't give the units for acceleration, so there it is on the end, meters per second per second, okay? So, hope you're able to get that one. Fairly typical kind of pulley kind of question, okay? So, let's move on. We're on to question three now, okay? So, no, we're not on question three, sorry. We just had question three. We're on question four. So, moving on to question four. Here we are, working with planes now, okay? Typical kind of diagram that you're gonna get in an exam paper, textbook, where we have, say, a smooth plane. We've got this particle A on the plane. Its mass is five kilograms. The angle of the plane to the horizontal is 30 degrees. And we've got this particle A accelerating up the plane at 2 meters per second per second. And if we take G to be 9.8 meters per second per second, the question is, find the size of that force P that's needed to make that particle move up this smooth plane at 2 meters per second per second, okay? Right, so again, leave you with that one to just try.
Okay, welcome back. Let's see how you got on. Well, with this kind of problem, what you need to do is mark on your forces. And the first force that we want to put on is the weight um, of the particle, which acts vertically downwards. It's going to be the mass of 5 times the acceleration due to the gravity, so it's 5g, and the units of that force are newtons. Okay. There's also going to be a normal reaction a contact force from the plane. So we call that one R and the units will be in Newtons. Now what I would normally do now is mark in some dotted lines perpendicular to the plane and parallel to the plane. We're going to use these okay. We need to be considering the forces that act in these directions parallel to the plane and perpendicular to the plane. Now I can see that all of the P Newtons is on that dotted line parallel to the plane and I can see that all of R is perpendicular to the plane is on that line but the 5G Newton force the weight of the particle is not on either that line or that line so what we need to do is think of splitting this into two components. And I'm assuming that you're familiar with splitting forces into components. If not, do check this out on my website, okay? Splitting a force into components. What we need to do is find either this angle in here or this angle in here. Well, it's very common to take this angle. It's always the same as the angle of the plane. That's because if you think of this right angle triangle in here, this is 90 degrees, you've got 30 degrees here, that would make that angle 60 degrees. This angle here between the dotted lines is 90 degrees, so if this is 60, this again will now be 30 degrees, okay, if you take 60 away from 90 degrees. So after a while, you'll always should, you know, you should always remember that this angle is the same as the angle of the plane. So when it comes to working out the components of the weight, they're going to be one in this direction and one down the plane, okay? One into the plane, one down the slope, if you like, okay? Now, the one that contains the angle, I would have shown you in that video, is a cosine one. It's 5G cosine 30. The one that doesn't contain the angle, this one here, okay? is a sine component, 5G sine of angle 30 degrees. All right, so if we mark those components in, they're gonna be these two, 5G cosine 30, 5G sine 30. Now, we could remove that weight, okay? And now we've got a situation where we've just got the forces acting parallel to the plane and perpendicular to the plane and these forces are perpendicular to these ones and they have no effect when it comes to resolving up the plane. Resolving up the plane we're using force equals mass times acceleration, Newton's law of motion, okay? Taking upwards as positive I've got all of P minus the 5g sine 30, the component of the weight down the plane, that will be my resultant force F. Remember these two forces being perpendicular don't have any effect in the motion. So our equation then will be P minus the 5g sine 30 equals the mass M times the acceleration of 2. Just need to rearrange this now to get P. If you rearrange that then you'll find that P turns out to be 34.5. We're looking for the magnitude of P. We know it's measured in Newtons, okay? So it's just 34.5. One extra note here. If ever you were asked to find out what that normal contact force was, you'd resolve perpendicular to plane and you would get R minus the 5G cosine 30 degrees. That's our resultant force equals zero because it's not moving uh, relative to the plane in that direction, okay? It's in equilibrium re in that direction, if you like, relative to the plane. 
So R turns out to be 5G cosine 30, and you could work that out depending on what your value of G is, okay? Now, if I was doing this problem, I wouldn't be marking in these components. I would just take them out, have my dotted lines, but have that weight back in with my angle. That's what my diagram would look like. I would see those components uh, without marking them in. So that's why I've just taken them back out. Okay, so that would just lead to the same equations and hopefully you can see it like that. Okay. Okay, well, let's just now move on to the last question. And here it is, number five then. A particle moves along the x-axis. Initially, the particle is moving with a speed of three meters per second in the positive x direction. The acceleration of the particle at time t seconds, where t is greater than or equal to naught, is 5t to the power of 4 minus 10t meters per second per second in the positive x direction. Find the velocity of the particle at time t seconds. Okay, so just leave you again for a few moments just to work this out. Okay, let's see how you got on. When you're doing work like this, just briefly, it's on variable acceleration, okay, not constant acceleration. So we need to use calculus. So if we let x be the displacement, t the time, v the velocity, a the acceleration of a particle, then v is given by dx by dt. If we work backwards, x is the integral of v with respect to t. And the acceleration is dv by dt. And if we work backwards, v is equal to the integral of the acceleration with respect to time. And it's this that we're going to be using in this question, okay? v is equal to the integral of the acceleration with respect to time. So we'd need to set that up. We integrate the acceleration, 5t to the power of 4 minus 10t, okay, with respect to t. And if you integrate this in the standard way where you add 1 to the power and divide by the new power, then you're going to get this as your result, okay? So you should be familiar with that. But don't forget the constant of integration, c, which is what we're going to need to be working out. Well, we need to clean this up. I can see that we can cancel the fives here and the two will go into the 10. So if we uh, tidy that up, this is what we get. t to the power of five minus five t squared plus that constant of integration. So how do we work out that constant of integration? Well, we're given some info up the top here. We can see that the word initially is mentioned. So that's gonna be when time is zero. When t equals zero, the particle is moving with a speed of three meters per second in the positive x direction. That's important, this in the positive x direction. They're saying that v, v remember is velocity, not speed, so it has direction. The speed, the magnitude of velocity is three, but because it's in the positive x direction, it will be plus three. If it said it had been going in the negative x direction, then we would have had to say v was minus three. So we now know that when t equals naught, v equals three. So we can set that up and we can number our equation here as one and sub our results here into one. And if you do that, you'll find that we end up with v, which is three, equals zero minus zero plus c. So we end up with three equaling c. And now we know that c equals three, we just need to substitute it back into one. And if you substitute it back into one, you've got your equation for V in terms of the time T. Okay, so hope you're able to get that one. Okay, well that brings us now to the end of this workout and I hope you got some value from it. If you did, give us a thumbs up, that'd be really cool. And uh, also you might want to uh, subscribe so that you get more notifications of when I'm putting up more stuff. Okay, 
mind you, you could check out in the description below. There's a diary uh, of telling you when these events are coming up. Just click on the link. So hopefully I'll see you again. More workouts coming your way 10 o'clock every weekday. OK, so uh, join me then. We'll be doing pure maths, mechanics and statistics. Have a great day. See you again later. Bye.